Not gonna lie, I had a lot of fun doing the last video for this series. So much so that I feel like doing the next part of it now, I hope you don't mind. Basically, what we've got going on so far, if you need a little jog to the memory, is that Itachi slaughtered the Uchiha clan in front of Sasuke inflicted Genjutsu on Sasuke over and over again and basically told him the same as he did in the original timeline, which was, you're not worth killing, but I'll spare you until you get Mangekyo's Sharingan, then come fight me. But the issue with that was Itachi didn't realize how much this truly affected Sasuke, and had yet to realize that Sasuke had awakened his Mangekyo Sharingan. This revelation, as well as Sasuke's reaction, drove Itachi to the breaking point, and despite his honor and love for his brother, he couldn't separate himself from him, so he decided to bring Sasuke with him to the Akatsuki. The brothers are settling into their new life and have found a strange air about the organization. Not everything is as it seems. There are those who, though misguided, appear to be rather pure. Some are lost in their lives, and some seek only their own profit. What sort of bonds can come of this? I suppose we can only wait and see. Welcome to the Amagi! Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. We've also noticed that a lot of the folks watching our videos aren't actually subscribed to the Amagi. We know that YouTube does do a fantastic job of getting you what you want to watch, but if you don't want to miss a video, and if you want to support the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Thanks so much. The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. Itachi had been paired up with Juzo Biwa, the former ninja swordsman of Kiri who had carried the pilfered executioner's blade. Itachi supposed that there could have and would have been worse choices to team up with. How many of these could be trusted? Sasori, the controller, Kakazu, the rabid animal, Orochimaru, the snake in the grass. Juzo was a swordsman, and so he had honor. Honor not in his village, but in himself. His blade was his only friend, and he planned to both live by it and die by it. There was something in Juzo that reminded Itachi of himself. There was a lot. He was insanely brutal in combat, but he was also efficient, and that efficiency was what led to Juzo being considered as dangerous as he was. He was professional in the field, but also possessed a somewhat laid-back personality that could focus on humor. There was a side to him that made Itachi comfortable, something that felt like home, as if he were back in the Anbu all over again. And much like himself, Juzo was a rogue who was driven out and hunted by his country just for doing his mission. But unlike Itachi, Juzo held resentment in his heart for his village. To a point, Itachi almost felt bad about spying on the Akatsuki. From an early age, Itachi was always gifted in sympathizing with others. He had seen the darkness of the shinobi world and grew to detest it. Despite that, he engulfed his entire being in said darkness. He hated when people got their hands dirty, but he knew someone had to do it, so it might as well be those who were capable. And he was more than capable. It was his dream that one day nobody would ever have to see war and death, and because such a day had not yet come, he had to wage war like no man had ever waged before in hopes of digging straight to bedrock, going straight to the source of the problem and eradicating it. Well, that's what he had previously believed anyway. These days, Itachi didn't really know what the best path to peace was. The Akatsuki were in the middle of some plan to enact peace. To some, they might think it's crazy and extreme, and, and while Itachi could not condone their actions against his village and would stand opposed to their attempts to harm Konoha, he also couldn't say for certain that they were entirely wrong. He was never really a wide-eyed and idealistic person. He was a realist and saw the world for what it was and Payne's belief was simply to bring peace through the only language humanity shared in common, and that was pain and war. Humans were incapable of understanding each other or their plans, and only through inflicting it could brotherhood bonds be formed. Anger begets anger, vengeance begets vengeance, hatred begets hatred. It was an endless cycle that could only reach a conclusion when all power was on one side and no power remained to resist. When dualities became singularities, when yin and yang became wuji, only then could they be free from the causal nexus that the world fell into like a bad habit. Itachi found himself caught between his belief that they were all insane terrorists and his belief that maybe they were right. 
Itachi had always been taught to see the full picture from every angle, and he hoped to teach Sasuke the same. While he believed that pain was at least coming from an understandable and possibly correct place, Itachi's loyalty was and would forever remain with Konoha. As imperfect as it was, that was his home. And even if he could never live there, even if he was hated and hunted by those he protected, he would never stop loving it. Itachi entered the room where he had left Sasuke. The boy was still sleeping, his plush by his side, paper frog on the table beside the bed. He seemed to be sleeping peacefully. What could he be dreaming about, Itachi wondered. Perhaps he was reliving a happy memory with his parents. Perhaps a dream in which none of this had ever happened. He loved watching Sasuke sleep and regretted the fresh wounds he would feel upon waking up. To know that those dreams were only dreams and would never again be possible. That affected Itachi. Every so often, whether it was an intrusive thought or a complicated side of himself, he would find himself asking if he shouldn't have killed Sasuke too. There wasn't any reason save mercy. Sasuke would do better with their parents instead of someone like him. And though death was that thing people feared, at the end of it all, it was nothing like that. The body was merely a home where your true self lived. For some, the house would be destroyed or burned down. Others would find infestations of termites or some other disease that would slowly wear it away until it needed to be condemned. But no matter what, the human soul was immortal. The true you was immortal. And even if the body passed away, the soul would live on eternally, just in a different spatial location. That thought was what kept him strong. He hadn't ended his parents' existence, he had merely sent them to a new home in which to live, one that they agreed would be a better place to be. He kept their memory alive in his heart and kept his view that they still existed, just in another place away from him, equally as real as the cave where he stood. This was the thought he used to comfort himself, the thought he used to quell the terror and guilt that any other way would have led to Harakiri by self-conviction. Itachi would stroke Sasuke's head. Suddenly, there was a presence by the door, like pure death, unfocused at the moment. Itachi looked to see Pain standing there. What can I do for you, Lord Pain? Pain looked in. This child, why is he here? Itachi looked at Sasuke. He's my little brother. I couldn't leave him behind. Pain was silent for a time. You know that our place is no place for a child. He will be exposed to rough individuals. He will learn of war with his own eyes and be exposed to the same danger we are. And even though you know this, you chose to bring him with you. Itachi was silent for a time. Pain's eyes truly were ones that saw truth. Why? Pain asked. Is it because of love? No. If that had been the case, then you would have left him where it's safe. Is it attachment? Is this love for him or for yourself? Itachi was silent. Are you going to make me let him go? Pain didn't speak immediately, letting the words that bore the weight of Itachi's heart fill the room and fully express themselves. He then spoke. No, you are now free to do as you will. I won't force you to separate yourself from your beloved brother. Once upon a time, I too had a brother. I say this not to force any reaction from you, but as a proverb, never bring with you that which you cannot afford to lose. Itachi nodded. Pain then spoke. Your first mission will be with Juzo Biwa. There's a contract out on a politician from Kusa. You're to go there and kill him, no matter what. And while you're there, there's a secondary mission that should line up. You're to demolish a bridge that's being used to circumvent an old settlement which now suffers because traders pass them by for the new bridge. Kill your target and then make your way to the bridge and demolish it. Then head to the location on the map to claim the bounty. Return to headquarters thereafter with the full payment and you shall receive a percentage of the reward as your cut. Itachi nodded. He looked back down at Sasuke. Pain spoke. If you fear for your brother, then entrust him to the care of Conan. She will take care of him. Do not let your affection for your brother cloud your judgment. Itachi nodded. He shook Sasuke a bit and woke him up. Sasuke opened his eyes and sat up in bed, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Big brother. Itachi smiled kindly. I have to go on a mission, Sasuke. I'll be gone for some time, perhaps a few days to a week. I'm going to need you to stay with Miss Conan, okay? Do as she asks and treat her with the same respect that you would treat me, alright? Sasuke nods. Itachi picks up a bag and begins to head out through the same doorframe where Pain stood. Once Itachi was out of sight, Sasuke turned his gaze toward the shadow of Pain, his Rinnegan being the only thing visible besides the slight color of his own outline. Sasuke shivered a bit and swallowed hard. Pain looked down on him. Within his mind, Pain possessed complex feelings over this situation. 
an equal balance of emotion and logic. Emotionally, he sought to offer compassion to both Sasuke and Itachi by offering protection to the boy who had found himself in this situation. However, the logical side to his thinking was that Itachi had brought with him a burden and baggage that would likely get in the way of their effectiveness. Pain just hoped that Itachi's skill was not overblown by Tobi and Orochimaru. If Itachi was causing the Akatsuki more trouble than he was worth, there would be hell to pay. Come with me, he said simply. Sasuke slowly, but grudgingly crawled out of bed and began to follow Pain, feeling as if the Grim Reaper were leading him off to die. Sasuke would be brought to Conan. Pain looked to her. This child will be your responsibility until his elder brother returns from mission. Can you accommodate? Conan looked down at Sasuke for a moment before returning her gaze to Pain. I can. Pain turned to leave before stopping. Consider offering him some training. If he has any potential as a shinobi, it should be molded now. It's only fair that Sasuke brings something to this table besides burden. Conan nodded. She looked down at Sasuke and smiled before offering him a paper butterfly. What do you know about being a shinobi? Sasuke shrugged. A few jutsu. Conan's smile became even lighter. Okay, how about we do some training then? Don't worry, I promise we can make it fun. Sasuke smiled. Okay. Itachi and Juzo were walking down the road alone. They were surrounded by tall rice plants on both sides. The rice hung down before them. As Itachi looked at it, he surely felt that this field alone could provide for an entire village for quite some time. It was a wonder to him that there was so much hunger in the world when food in some places was so plenteous and easy to get a hold of. Damn! They're late, Juzo said as he stood there with his blade. They were in the middle of a road where their target was said to be passing through. Makes me wonder if they caught on or something, Juzo said. Itachi continued to dwell on the rice in the field and continued to contemplate the situation that the world was in. Greed. It has been said that the love of money is the root of all evil. Nations vying for power and influence care only about optics and less for what is actually right. Itachi was a byproduct of that. Konoha needed to get rid of the Uchiha, but they didn't want to own it. They didn't believe to be viewed as genocidal maniacs, despite the fact that this is what they truly were. And so they used Itachi to do it and then cast him aside like a used kunai when the deed was done. Cast him off and put a bounty on his head. This field was another victim of this. So much food, and it was merely one portion of what the world was capable of providing. Yet people starved without food and water. It wasn't that these people couldn't be helped. It was that there was no profit in doing so. To do something out of the kindness of your heart did not line your pockets. It did not ensure you a future. To share excess was still sharing, and sharing meant you lost so others could gain. Itachi couldn't help but realize that the first lesson of human interaction that children were taught by their parents and guardians, sharing, just so happened to be the one thing humanity could never seem to grasp. Itachi's mind moved to Pain's movement, how he wished to bring peace to the world by destroying its ability to fight. Itachi understood this and believed that it had the possibility to truly succeed. But for how long could it work? Who was to say that the Akatsuki themselves wouldn't just settle down and become the warmongers, the greedy politicians, the ones unwilling to share? Were they trading in a thousand tyrants, for one? As much as Pain believed in his goals, Itachi knew that most everything in this world was temporary, and that included the generation living in it. Pain would one day grow old and die, as all things did, and his legacy would be left to the next generation. Yes, he could choose and train one to replace him, but slowly, as generations past, that dream and the understanding of pain and the abhorrence of corruption would slowly be diluted until one generation completely forgot the lessons pain taught and renewed the cycle torn down. The world was chaos, and the natural order was disorder. To build a country, an empire, to build an ideal, eventually everything was eroded. Nothing ever remained what it was. People changed, their ideals changed, what they wanted and what they fought for changed. Yesterday's enemies became tomorrow's allies, and the rich of this generation would only find the empire given to them by generations of hard work pissed away until the spoiled children who knew no hardship were forced to lose that which they took for granted. To be rich was not wrong. To make money was not wrong. To forget how you did it, why you did it, and forget those less fortunate, well, that was something totally different. Itachi supposed it not to be much different from kings. From one generation, a man fought for freedom and led his people. The next generation lived in excess and began to believe what it meant to be king was to be served. The difference between those who worked for their peace, worked for their freedom, and those who merely inherited it was that as generations passed, the meaning behind it, the value, was diminished and taken for granted until it was gone and the world was left in a worse state. 
This cycle of winning and losing, this cycle of building and destroying, was as fragile as a flower in the wind. The irony in this world was that the only thing that never changed was change itself. Itachi then began to wonder to himself, what do I fight for? What does anyone fight for? We live and die in wars, waging battles and fighting for things, only for those who never lifted a finger to trade it all away for something subpar, like a child who chooses a nickel over a dime because the nickel looks bigger. So why do we fight? And who do we fight for? Itachi had no answer. Why should anyone ever fight for anything besides themselves? In a world where everything was temporary, what good would dying to change things matter? Everything changed on its own. Change was free, so why were they paying for it? Itachi thought back to Sasuke and the world he would grow up in, and perhaps the world in which Sasuke's children would grow up. Itachi was fighting for himself, the things he cared about in the present. His village was a proponent of the world's endless cycle that Itachi so hated, yet he loved that village and would die for it. This was the warrior's conundrum. This was the men of peace going to war. This was the symbol of humanity and why, through even all of our sciences, no one could understand the human mind. That was because there was no logic, rhyme, or reason to our thoughts. Our minds were a melting pot of chaos and random samples that we pulled out of thin air. Infinite stupidity and infinite chaos, from which one may occasionally pull a nugget of truth. Humans disagreed with themselves and that was a part of it. The two hemispheres, the left and right side, one for emotion and the other for logic. One to make sense and act accordingly and the other to act without sense. This was what humanity was and it- You really aren't one for small talk, are you? Juzo said, interrupting Itachi's introspection. Itachi looked over. Huh? Oh, sorry. I was just thinking. Juzo rolled his head on his neck. I've been over here talking for at least 15 minutes while you stare off into space. What are you even talking about? Itachi looked to him. It was nothing. Ah, come on. Don't give me that. Let me see inside your brain. Itachi sighed. I was trying to understand human nature. Why we fight for things that ultimately are impossible or things that'll never last. Why we give our lives for things that will eventually pass away. Juzo scoffed. You're seriously contemplating the meaning of life? You know we're here to kill, correct? Itachi smiled, realizing that he was proving the point in his own head that humans are contradictory creatures. Perhaps so, but I just can't help but wonder what any of it means. Juzo lifted the executioner's blade and laid it across his shoulder. I'm no philosopher, but I can try and tackle your question. But to answer it, let me give you another question. We're all born into this world with an expiration date, correct? We're born to live, yet we die and everything we do is eventually forgotten. My name will not be remembered a thousand years from now, and everything I've done will be forgotten and no longer in use. It'll be like I never existed at all. So why do you think I go through with the process of living at all? Itachi looked over questioningly. Juzo spoke. Because I'm free. I get to decide what I do with my life and what it's worth spending on. People say that you can't put a price on human life, but that's false. You can put a price on it. And the price of that human life is dependent on how many years you're remembered. How many people remember you. How you affected the world and what people think of you. All our lives, we spend trying to increase our own value. Why do we do that? Because we want to feel good about ourselves. We want to feel like we're good people. That people respect us. The value of a human life is what people are willing to give or take due to you. The bingo book, for example. You have a bounty. They literally put a price on your life. The guy we're about to kill has a price too. We want to feel special, like there's nobody like us in the world, but the truth is, we're all the same. Humans exist, and there are bound to be people alive either now, in the past, or in the future who look like us and have similar, if not the same, experiences and reactions. We're not unique or special. Everything in this world has a price, and it's up to us to decide what's worth spending our value on. Itachi thought about this. That's not too different from what Orochimaru believes. Juzo shrugged. Orochimaru's a nerd. He thinks way too much anyway. It sounds like you think quite a bit too, Itachi said. Juzo laughed. We all do. Our mind is always active. But what we focus it on determines who we are. Itachi shook his head a bit as a scowl crawled over his face. I don't know. I don't like to think of humanity that way. That we're meaningless. Worthless. Or it doesn't matter. I know we're meant for something greater. It's like humanity is incomplete. And on a subconscious conscious level, we all know it, and we strive for perfection. And what is perfection? Juzo asked. Itachi didn't know. Interpretations on that are as varied as there are reasons to fight. What is it that makes us complete? And why do we give our lives to help make others complete? 
Maybe it's because by attempting to make others complete, we make ourselves complete, Juzo said. Or maybe I just read that off a fortune cookie. Is this really the time to debate why birds fly and why we breathe air? Itachi sighed. You're right. Now, what are you trying to tell me? Finally, Juzo said with relief. I wanted to know what you're good at. What are your strengths and weaknesses? I'm good with Genjutsu and Shuriken Jutsu. I'm average with Ninjutsu and my Taijutsu is about average as well. Juzo nodded. As you can see, I swing about a heavy blade. It's slow but strong, and with proper technique, I can maximize the momentum and cleave a lot faster. Beyond that, I have some basic ninjutsu. Itachi then asked, Why is it that you wish to know? Juzo pulled his thumb across his nose with a hint of pride. Know yourself and know your enemy, and victory will come to you. Itachi smiled. So you are a philosopher. It's another fortune cookie, Itachi, Juzo said. The two began to laugh. Suddenly, they heard a flock of birds fly off. They quickly turned and got ready. In the distance, they saw a group of warriors bearing katana walking as unarmed servants bore a palanquin on their shoulders. Is that the target? Itachi asked. His Sharingan activated, attempting to search for any detail that would give away this target. Beats me. I don't see anyone else coming down this highway. Itachi noticed the crest of the target politician on the palanquin. Confirmed. This is our target. Juzo thought about it. Doesn't look like the guards are all that impressive. Probably designed to stop bandits, Itachi said. Well, they're about to get more than they bargained for, Juzo said. He then looked back at Itachi. This'll be the perfect practice to build up our synergy. How about we form our first formation? Formation, Itachi asked. Of course, Juzo replied. We're gonna build up our team synergy by creating planned strategies. For this one, I think we should do a little sleight of hand. You're an Uchiha, yeah? That makes your natural affinity fire release. I need you to step up in front of me and launch flame jutsu at them. That will distract them. Then I come down from above. They'll never see it coming. All right, Itachi said, agreeing to the plan. The two then set into motion. Honestly, this might have been overkill and Juzo knew that, but as he said before, this was designed to improve their teamwork. These guys were nothing more than practice to them, and that's exactly how it felt. Like a group of straw men set up only to be knocked down as they had in the past when Juzo was first coming to understand how to wield the executioner. With that, with what felt like a hot knife through butter, the palanquin was severed and from within came the red, sticky liquid that Juzo remarked somehow reminded him of the feeling he got when cutting open a fried egg. They collected their prize. All right, now that we have this, we can be on our way. Itachi pulled out their map. We have our secondary mission to complete. This bridge here has been causing no end of trouble for this little settlement here, and there's a secret bounty put out on the termination of the bridge. Juzo nodded. Easy peasy. No guards, just rocks. A couple of rolls of paper bombs and the mission's complete. And so they made their way to the bridge where they would line it with explosives. Once they finished, they stepped a ways away and activated the bombs, blowing the bridge sky high. Easiest 30 grand I've made in my life, Juzo said as he made his way down the road to the settlement. There they picked up the reward for destroying the bridge before making their way to the bounty post. They offered proof of their kill and received a cool 3 million ryo. They then began making their way back to the Akatsuki base. Once they arrived, they made their way straight to Pain, who was waiting for them by the cliff's edge, watching as twilight slowly began to rise over it, the penumbra of the Earth's own shadow becoming increasingly visible as the planet continued to spin through space. Itachi let Juzo do all the talking. We're back, boss, and we brought with us a cool 3,030,000 ryo. You did well, Payne stated. Taking the money from them, he informed them that he would have their cut calculated and delivered at his earliest convenience. From there, they were free to do whatever it was they pleased. Juzo went his own way, blade in hand, and Itachi decided to go check up on Sasuke. He came to Sasuke and Conan, and found Conan sitting in a chair with a bit of a smile on her face as Sasuke runs around wearing an Akatsuki cloak that appeared a million sizes too large. Itachi was not amused. Well, he was because it was cute, but he wasn't amused with the concept of Conan trying to induct indoctrinate his brother into this life. He was afraid that Sasuke was forgetting the entire reason why they were there, which was to stop these people. Sasuke ran up to him. Guess what, big brother? Itachi smiled. What is it, Sasuke? Sasuke, eyes wide and very excited, spoke. I've been doing some training with Miss Conan. Someday soon, I'll be able to go on missions with you. The idea of Sasuke going on missions with him was more than he was willing to accept. He had already ruined his own future, but Sasuke still had plausible deniability. He was a kid who hadn't done much of anything yet. If Itachi dropped him off at the gates of Konoha now, they would take him in with no second thoughts. After all, he was innocent 
innocent and had done nothing criminal. They would call it a case of kidnap escapee and take care of him. But if he began going on missions for the Akatsuki, he would suddenly find his future closed to him, and that wasn't something Itachi was willing to let him go through with. But he smiled anyway. Sounds like you're gonna get strong. Just promise not to leave me in the dust, okay? Sasuke giggled and hugged Itachi. Itachi was glad to see Sasuke in good spirits. After everything that had happened, it was nice to see that Sasuke was capable of letting things roll off his back. But then again, he assumed that this was in no small part thanks to Conan. She had an air about her that seemed to say that she was treating Sasuke as if he were her own little brother. Looking around, it was clear that she had been teaching him arts and crafts to keep him occupied. He could tell which origami were made by Sasuke and which weren't based on how wrinkly the paper was. But he was getting there. He pat Sasuke's back and let Sasuke continue to play. Itachi would approach Conan. I want to thank you for taking care of Sasuke for me. He seems to be doing better than he was when I left him. Conan did not lose her smile as she spoke to Itachi. That's probably thanks to the origami I've been teaching him. They say that idle hands do the devil's work. Keeping him busy has helped his mood improve quite a bit. Itachi knew this to be true, but he believed things to be far simpler than that. Sasuke had taken a liking to Conan. Given that she was a woman much older than he was, it's likely that he had imprinted upon her some form of motherhood, searching for in her the things he could no longer find in his own late mother. And it seemed that Conan either knew that or was instinctively providing these things to him, which made Itachi wonder if she truly was cut out to be in a world as dark as this one. Her dyed hair and pierced lip gave off an emo vibe that hinted at darkness, but that was something totally different. She, like Pain, had known hardships, but her true self wasn't one of pain and suffering, nor was it one to be found in the darkness of the shinobi world. No, she was one who should be enjoying life in a village somewhere, protecting the innocence of children as opposed to what she was doing in this organization. Then again, some could have said the same of Itachi. He simply did not possess the malice to be truly cruel. He was a quick hand and precise, easy to defend itself and others, but one that offered mercy to those who were in need, regardless of the side they fought for. The whole ordeal was strange, especially considering that Sasuke was now being raised by criminals who surprisingly weren't doing that bad of a job. As Itachi spoke with Conan, none of them had noticed yet that Sasuke was no longer in the room with them. Itachi was the first to pick up on this. Oh, it seems that Sasuke's wandered off. Perhaps I should go after him. Conan nodded as she stood. It's probably best that I retire for the night. I bid you good day, Uchiha Itachi. Itachi bid her good day as well and began to wander off himself. Sasuke, he called around the corner. There was no response. Sasuke, Itachi called out, loud and authoritative, as if commanding him to show himself. There was still no response. Itachi began to get a bad feeling in the pit of his stomach. He walked around the base searching for his brother until he came to a darker corner near the barracks where they would sleep. There he saw Sasuke standing, a slight worried expression upon his face. His arms wrapped tightly around his plush as he seemed to take a step back. Before him was Orochimaru, who had knelt down to speak to Sasuke more at his level. Orochimaru smiled as he spoke and tried to sound as kind as possible. All the same, he couldn't disguise his darker nature, as well as his obvious ill intent. And whether it was because Sasuke was just sensitive to this sort of thing, or simply because he wasn't as naive as one might think a child would be, he was distrusting of this. Hey, Itachi called out, stepping toward them. Sasuke looked back and saw him before rushing to his brother's side to hide behind his leg. Orochimaru came to his full height slowly, as if afraid that any sudden movements might set Itachi off. What are you doing here with my brother? Itachi demanded. Orochimaru gave a sly smile. What? Am I not allowed to make small talk with a fellow Akatsuki member? He said in reference to Sasuke's cloak. Sasuke's off limits, he said to Orochimaru in a tone most menacing. Quite the overprotective big brother. It's not like I was doing anything wrong. I was merely asking him about his personal life, trying to get to know him a little better. We both know that's not true, Itachi said. You're a snake. I know who you are and what you've done. Orochimaru scoffed. Quite the judgmental one, aren't we? If you think you're any better than I am, you're sorely mistaken, clan killer. Itachi stood there resolute. I'll say this, and I'll say it only once. Sasuke is off limits. If I ever see you near him, if I ever hear his name on your lips, if you even sneeze in his direction, I'll show you personally how I killed my clan. Is that a threat? Orochimaru asked. Itachi took a breath. Come now, 
For someone as smart as you, do you need to ask such a question? Orochimaru grit his teeth a little and prepared to speak, but then he noticed Conan in the background, watching all of this unfold. Orochimaru took another deep breath. I suppose this is what I get for trying to be nice. He turned around and began to leave. Itachi turned to Sasuke and picked him up. Are you okay? Sasuke seemed a little shaken. I don't like that man. He wants to do bad things to me, Sasuke said simply. What, did he say something? Sasuke shook his head, his declaration being based purely off of intuition. I just... No. Itachi held them close. I won't let him hurt you, ever, okay? Sasuke hid in Itachi's shoulder. Itachi turned his attention back toward the direction Orochimaru had gone. Yeah, just mess around and find out, snake, he whispered to himself. He would then turn with Sasuke and walk away. And that's a chapter. I hope you enjoyed this one. I'm having a lot more fun with this than I probably should. Itachi is just always so fun to write for. He's a thoughtful character, so that leaves plenty of room for introspection, which allows me to really dive into the meaning behind the shinobi world, its functions, and the way people try to change it. I'm also enjoying the inclusion of Conan into the story and how important she's becoming. To be honest, when I have Conan make use of an origami shape to give to Sasuke, I always tend to look up how it's made to help keep with the realism. And now I can safely say I've developed a new hobby. Nothing soothes the soul quite like adding a third dimension to a two-dimensional piece of paper. But anyway, what did you think of the video? Did you enjoy it? If you did, tell us all about it. And if you have anything to say about the story, let me know about that too. I like hearing about the different directions you guys like me to take, and I really do take what you say into consideration. So if you have any elements you want added or removed, just let me know and I'll see what I can do. Don't forget to like the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe and ring the bell to be notified of our latest content as it drops. Until next time, peace. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.